Hello and welcome to the episode 49 of the 905er. Uh, my name is Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. And we're going to have another a general roundup of 905 news today. And um, we're going to start off with, with guess what, COVID-19. Uh, I hear it's quite a big story. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, in particular, there's there's a, been an article in the Global Mail today about uh, something that the... Uh, uh, provincial government was up to. I mean, uh, Joel, what's uh, what was your take on this? Yeah, I mean, this came out uh, today, uh, this morning in the Global Mail and other news sources uh, that they were uh, the Ontario government has launched a, a commission into its conduct and you know, with the long term care homes uh, uh, since uh, since the pandemic began, and it's it's starting to uncover a, a kind of a narrative that it doesn't paint this. Uh, government in the best of lights, uh, to say the very least. Um, th- today, we, we learned that uh, basically, uh, Minister Elliott, Minister of Health for Ontario, uh, admitted that we had no PPE at the start of this pandemic. Um, it, in 2017, the previous Liberal government started to dispose of our uh, our our stockpile. Uh, most because it had all ex- it had expired, and that's what you do with it—you throw it out. Uh, but then this new government came into power in 2018 and didn't do anything to replenish our stockpiles. Um, it's it, but it says here by December of 2019, 90 percent of the stock stockpile was discarded and not replenished uh, before t- March of 2020, uh, which is uh, shameful and just bad planning in, in itself. Uh, but what I thought was most damning uh was the fact that the the in the course of this commission the the government uh, admitted that it ignored the advice of doctors and scientists the we did uh, we did not have the capacity the testing capacity to give everyone in the province a test when they wanted as they wanted it yet the premier decided to step to the microphone and say exactly that um which led to problems with trying to pinpoint where COVID-19 was in the long-term care uh, system. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a damning indictment of just how this government ha- uh, has approached this pandemic is that it's politics over science. Uh, it, it's, it's the decision to override the, the fact, the people on the ground, the epidemiologists, the doctors, the scientists who looked at it and said, yeah, I mean, it would be great to have you know, hey, you want a test? Go get a test. We got it. No problem. Not going to cause an issue. But our doctor said, we did not prepare for this. We didn't, you know, the assumption was, um, I'm going to say it, it's that co- that conservative, you know, the private sector will solve everything solution, right? The private sector is going to come up with a solution to this problem at some point down the road and government should just get off the back of, of free enterprise. Well, the problem is free enterprise doesn't care until there's a need in the market. And by the time the need in the market happened, it was too late to set up the logistics and the capacity and the financial capabilities for testing. This is, there's a reason why public health is a public uh, uh, department. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, mean, you know, I, I suspect that the uh, previous Liberal government wasn't entirely blameless in how it began disposing of this of the of the expired material, which sure it was expired. That's what's meant to happen. Uh, I don't believe there was a, a process in place for replacing it under them either. Um, however, you can quite see that you know, when a new government comes in, two thousand eighteen, looking to save money wherever it can. Hey, we're going to buy a whole load of masks, which may never get used. Oh, you've got to be kidding me! You know, it's it's um, it's so predictable. Um, the previous government might have and should have probably um, you know, introduced some kind of system for like a rolling restocking of the of this material because it was all kind of, as I understand it, all kind of bought one in one go after SARS, um, so it all expired in one go ten years later. Um, uh, yeah, I mean it, it, it's governments are not good at, at long term planning because they don't have long terms to plan for in. in in themselves, you know, so it's, it's, you're always fighting an uphill battle, but, but you know, um, that's one of those things that you could kind of put into your policies or into your regulations that, yeah, you know, the, your PPE has an expiry shelf life of 10 years or, or whatever it is. If you say no here at every 10 years, starting on this date, we must replenish 
uh, PPE or, or, you know, and just leave it and write it. If you have to write it into law, you're right. The previous liberal government could have done that as they were leaving office. They said, okay, you know what? We have to throw this out. You know what? Let's just write this law. You know, every 10 years from now, you have to replenish this capacity. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you have to write into the budget, no matter what, this has to be uh, replenished and stockpiled uh, based on the SARS, at the time, be the SARS pandemic. Now, now we'll have the COVID-19 protocols or, or whatever it will be going forward. Uh, but the sad thing is, you know, may, maybe 10 years from now, there'll be a NDP or a liberal government that'll do the exact same. Oh, we'll throw, you know, PP will be expired. I oh, will throw it out. It'll save us, you know, we're, we're saving money on the budget. Um, well, the, the you know, this, this is what traditionally goes into the, um, into the column of government waste, um, which is such a, such a, um, universal concern, uh, that every government is, is, is promising to reduce government waste. Um, when it comes down to it, it seems to me that every government I've ever seen has been incredibly bad at actually reducing waste. And what they do is they cut services. I'm not saying that the waste doesn't exist. Um, I just think that where the waste is, uh, tends to be, um, ring fenced by some fairly powerful um, government administrators who well, I, do not want to get fired. Well, I think um, when you, when you want to talk about government waste. I think it, government is no more wasteful than the private sector. The, the, I think there's a myth out there that the private sector is this paragon of efficiency and, and innovation. And, you know, clearly we haven't because, you know, nobody, ste- nobody stepped up to fill the, uh, the, the, the testing gaps. Uh, as the minister of uh, health described that we we've had all this, you know, this mad r- rush and the, the premier to come and say, Oh, well, everybody gets a test. You want it like Oprah handing out tests to the public. You want a test, you get a test, you get a test. And we, we can't do it. We, we had to be, I think the problem is we had to be very judicial and very targeted with our testing. Uh, and we're and honestly, we're, I think we're feeling it now because we said this before in a previous episode. Um, we don't know where the virus is. Per se. We have an, a general idea of, yes, case numbers have gone up. They have gone up in this region and in this, uh, uh, you know, in this neighborhood, if you will, but that always shifts around. But we have no idea of, is the virus in our schools? Is it in workplaces? How is it being transmitted around? Where do we need to clamp down? Uh, and, and instead, we're at this, like, we go, go, go until numbers get to a point where we do, go into lockdown. And then everybody gets upset and ticked off. Small businesses don't know if they're going to survive. And it's ridiculous. Like we, 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 this is, we're coming up on a year that we've been living with COVID-19 and we haven't learned to do that. Uh, and it's mostly because I think it's clear this government has not listened to the scientists to say, Hey, let's invent, let's be inventive. Let's find a way to make this work. Uh, instead, it, it's been the shrug off to oh, the private sector will figure it out. They're, they're, you know, somebody in the private sector is going to figure out. Surprise, surprise! It takes a while for the private sector to get capital and get logistics and services and and whatnot set up. We we don't have the time to wait for that. We need well, and the, and there has to be a profit in them in it for well, that. So yeah, if you if, if the private sector is going to step in, then okay. Well, if you're asking them to do something that the government was going to do, well, the, they're still the money's still going to have to come from the government, but now you've got to take a cut of that for the right. for the business. I mean, it's like the the public private partnerships in, in in healthcare. It's like, well, um, you know, it's it's hospital costs X dollars to run. Yeah, they're not going to do it for a free. business on top of that. It needs to take a, you know a big whack of that and call it profit. Um, yeah, and, and the interesting uh, the article in the Globe is interesting for another cat. I mean, the doctor, uh, well, Merrily Fullerton, who is a doctor but also the uh, minister for long term care. Uh, just reading um, the comments on her uh, her testimony testimony to the um, uh, to the same uh, committee that um, Christine Elliott was talking to, um, and. She's quite surprisingly open, and um, you know, as usual, I'm kind of wondering why this is the third to last uh, paragraph in the in the in the article. Um, kind of openly admitting that um, that uh, well, again, that, that this I mean, unless they're trying to throw Doctor Williams under the bus and try to blame him for everything, but the um, saying that um, they were getting kind of contradictory. Um, uh, evidence on the on the on the uh, non the asymptomatic spread of uh, COVID, and that she thought 
there was asymptomatic spread, and yet Dr. Williams was saying there wasn't. Um, it does make me wonder if they'd, but then the perception all along has been that, that Dr. Williams has been kind of in the government's pocket and been willing to be very, um, to be willing to let the government get away with things that maybe other, other public health officers would not. Um, that's the perception. I'm not saying it's correct or incorrect. I'm just, that's certainly an, an impression I've been aware of. Um, so it's surprising to see two ministers kind of saying he was wrong on that now because he was saying asymptomatic spread. He wasn't convinced of that until August, which is kind of three months later than than everybody else. So it's, it's so much uncertainty and lack of clarity with everything to do with COVID-19, it seems to me, that you you, you kind of, you know, it's so frustrating that we're, we're still having these discussions now about what happened when – uh, or even where the it, where the illness is. I mean, it's just crazy. It just seems that this the 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 provincial government rode the initial praise that we all we all bestowed upon Doug Ford, um, and I mean at the time, yeah, I give him credit. He he handled it well. He did the right thing. Shut down the province and and kind of be the the stern figure that needed to be. I think, and you and I have talked about this. Uh, as soon as the numbers started to dip down in the summertime. He took that as like, okay, the job's done. We're 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 good. We haven't we no no issues. We 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 defeated this thing. Let's go, let's go have the barbecues and let's go out out and tour the province. And and he, yet there were clips of him going down to Windsor and saying to uh, you know, oh, we're going to build hospitals, we're going to build bridges and infrastructure and roads and all this. We're we're going to do all this great stuff. And he was riding high high in the hog. And I think it's clear now in hindsight, being twenty twenty, um, the. The province should have been hunkering down and developing a coherent plan for the second wave. And th- I, it's, I think it's going to come out that basically this government didn't do anything during the summer. It was it was content to 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 bask in the glow of a job well done, but a job not completed. And then and to have that happen, and then the second wave hit, and they were kind of like deer in the headlights. Oh my God, what do we do? And it's it's just. It's shameful and it's disgraceful, and quite frankly, I don't see how anybody can hold their head high saying that we did all we could do, because clearly they did not even listen to the people telling them this is the bare minimum you should be doing. Yeah, uh, and Dr. Fullerton, uh, or the, the Minister of Long-Term Care, um, seems to be trying to have uh, cake and eat it to an extent, but she's saying she's blaming Dr. Williams for for she's saying she was worried about asymptomatic spread on April the 2nd and was pointing out how many People in long-term care were getting the disease from uh, from other staff members, but was ignored. Uh, but then says, "Well, I, I had to listen to the experts." So she's kind of washing her, her hands of uh, yeah. taking any kind of uh, opinion. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't. Non- nobody comes out of this looking particularly good. And I mean, the, the mess in long-term care. I mean, if if the government doesn't have confidence in in the uh, public health officials, get different public health officials. I mean, that is their prerogative. Um, but you get the public health of officials, and then you trust them. You know, the government's role is to. Um, yep. You you should be listening to them, yes, but you also have the right to go find a different public health official. I guess you know. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's. It's just so frustrating. It's, it's like everybody pulling in different directions and, and getting nowhere fast. So it, it's kind of a, a, um, a, a story that we're all too familiar with now after a year. And uh, it seems like we're still in the general public, kind of depending on rumor and goodness knows what, to kind of work out what's actually going on and what's been happening and, and, and why it's happened. So what else is going uh, on? Um <laughs> Yeah, so well, there's a few things. I mean, actually, just just as we came on to record, um, we noticed that a, a, an article had gone, gone up on um, one star on the Spectator um, uh, from Robert Benzie, who's the Queens Park Bureau Chief uh, for the Star, um, saying that the province is somewhat backpedaling on the Highway Four Four Thirteen story mm-hmm. now. Um, Paul Calandra, who we'll all remember from his lovely time when he was uh, in the federal government, um, 
uh, has said, um, you know, a, a classic kind of downplaying of the whole story. Well, there's still a tremendous amount, I'm quoting here, there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. There's consultations that have to happen with our partners in the area and environmental assessment, dot, dot, dot. Um, once we com- accomplish all those consultations, if it makes sense for the highway to proceed, it will. If it doesn't, it won't. Well, that would make a lot more sense if there hadn't already been an environmental assessment and it hadn't already decided that there isn't a point for that road. Um, however, um, uh, it probably reflects the heat that they're taking over this issue, which also we spoke last week about um, their sudden announcement of an enthusiasm for the green belt. Um, uh, that they're definitely fe- feeling the heat, and uh, in some again, like we said last week, you know, the nine hundred five is so, such a key area for for the PCs mm-hmm. um, that if they, you know, it doesn't take a lot to make them feel panicky about ridings in the nine hundred five region. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, do, that, that's that's the state of play on that. I don't know how much we should read into it, but um, well, I uh, I think it's, a, it's I think they're trying to find a bit of a way out. Is my is my take on it? Uh, because they built they they came in gung ho, guns blazing. We're going to build a highway, and that's going to alleviate traffic woes. And we need it. We need it. And they were they were trying to sell it hard to the nine hundred five region. And I don't think the nine hundred five region bought it at all. Uh, <clears throat> we we learned on the the webinar that you and I were part of. Uh, we we learned that there's a a sizable grassroots opposition to this highway. Uh, they are organized and they are. Can, they are intending on trying to block this in every way that they can. Uh, they've uh, they've mobilized and they have they've had uh, the Mississauga and Brampton councils uh, vote in opposition to this highway. Halton Region has also voted in opposition to this highway. And my understanding is Vaughn. They're trying to organize in Vaughn to have uh, Vaughn City Council uh, vote in opposition. The the allies. For this highway, uh, for uh, that the government needs on their side, or the list is growing very, very thin uh, and very, very short. I think they're starting to realize we can't, we can't make the case anymore to uh, to the Ontario people, especially with the te- the price tag of six billion dollars in the middle of a pandemic. Like it, it's a, you know, you, you can't tell people like, yes, yeah, so let's spend six billion dollars to. Uh, Build a highway that ultimately people are saying we we don't we don't want it. It's not going to do us any good. It's not going to serve. It's not going to alleviate our congestion. I'll probably never ever ride it, but I and I don't want it. I, I wonder. I wonder if they. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> this this government is like an impulsive child. Yes. You know, you kind of feel like, oh, let's do this. Yeah. This is going to be great, awesome. Oh no, nobody likes it. Uh, you know, and it's certainly been. Um, uh, there have been a few governments. That I've ever been aware of, that I've through my lifetime been so willing to change direction when things are unpopular, which has been you know a boon to be honest, because um, some of the crazy stuff like uh, amalgamation of municipalities and stuff like that went um, went away quite quickly. So I'm wondering. I, I think that they assumed, and the, I think the premier would have assumed that this would be a popular policy, maybe not in every. Um, municipality but in several um york peel but we're looking at basically the two big peel municipalities have both asked the federal government to step in and insist on an environmental assessment i i Um, I suspect what's been going on is we're seeing the progressive conservatives develop their platform as they're governing uh if you remember if you remember back in the uh in the election this government did not have an actual platform it was just basically vote Kathleen Wynne and the liberals out. Get, they've been there for too long. Vote the bums out. Elect us. And I'm, uh, you know, we're going to stop the gravy train or, or, or whatever the pl- popular uh, slogan was. And um, that's what people did. People were just ang- they, they capitalized on the, on the zeitgeist of the moment of the time. The people in Ontario were fed up with the liberals. They wanted them out. They were tired of Kathleen Wynne uh, and, and the government and they voted, they wanted them out. So be it. It happens. Uh, but they didn't vote in a platform, and that's what we're seeing. That's why we're seeing this. I, I would suspect this jump into, hey, let's let's do this. This seems like a good idea, and then oh wait, people don't like it because they haven't done the research. They this government, when you hear traffic problems in the nine hundred five, your first reaction 
is, oh, we need to build a new highway. You know, you need the people need to drive somewhere. Except they they haven't bothered to talk to they never they, and their initial reaction wasn't to talk to anybody beyond the party faithful or the party donors who we know are uh, high are are mostly made up of the d- developer industry in this province. They didn't initially go to talk to you know to actually talk to the people in the nine hundred five in the in Mississauga in Brampton in Halton and said do do you need a highway do you want one and they would have realized the majority of us said. No, not not really. We 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 I like maybe, but not there. There's there's no point to it there. Don't build it there, and especially if it's going to cost six billion dollars. Don't put it, put money into something else. And um, and I think that that we've seen that behavior happen in this uh, kind of to feed off of our previous story happened in the pandemic where oh I have to make a po- an unpopular choice. Oh, people don't want it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to backtrack. People want to be open. Okay, we're going to open up, despite the fact that government, you know, scientists and government says no, you shouldn't. You, we need like you need to keep numbers down low. The biggest, the biggest telling telltale that was then uh, um, we were hitting three thousand new cases a day in the new year, and Dr. Williams comes up and said, "Yeah, we re- you know we need to bring those numbers down to one thousand a day." And people said, "Well, if that was the case, why didn't we lock us down at one thousand a day?" Like why 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 did you let it get this bad? Um, and that's kind of there's been the action. You know, they don't want to upset anyone, but they don't actually want to lead. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've been, I've been um, well, I say I've been. I said exactly this in a tweet the other day um, that I'm kind of surprised that Doug Ford, who you know, kind of proudly the poster boy for toxic masculinity. You know? <laughs> he's, he's like, oh, I'm actually a man. I'm old school. I'm blah, blah, blah. And, and when it comes right down to it, he he really isn't. He he doesn't like upsetting anybody. Um, and it's like, yeah, you gotta you gotta upset some people if you're if you're premier of a province. Well, and, the, um, the problem is by not ups, not wanting to upset anyone, he's upsetting all of us because no decisions are. Are made. You make a decision. We know that a decision will be made today. It'll probably be reversed next week or next month. Um, especially in, yeah, it's, it's like you can't govern that way. You, there's no way you got to you gotta stick with your guns. If you, if uh, you know, I'm not going to say uh, the, any good premier in this province has made decisions that weren't popular at the time, but they stuck by it because they made the case. We need to do this. We need to, we need to do project X, Y, and Z. Because the good of the province, I understand you're not going to like it, but it's for the it's the best for the 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 long term. Um, Doug Ford just doesn't really. He's a. He, I think he's really a, his Achilles heel is that he's afraid of upsetting anybody. Uh, he and you can see it, you see it in his press conferences. He he's absolutely terrified of having to defend his actions to somebody who says why 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 can't I go to into my favorite bar for a pint and to watch the Leafs game and. I normally you'd be like, yeah, normally I would, but you can't. You're you're you might be spreading COVID. Sorry. Don't take it personal. It, it's yeah, it's that kind of I mean, I guess and you know, they call it retail politics, don't you? And it's like, well, I guess customers are always right. Um uh but you you literally have to and I think this is a skill that that some of the most skilled, not necessarily politicians who I would look up to the most, but some of the ones who have been most successful know who they can for want of a better word um screw <laughs> because well that guy's never going to vote yes. for me anyway so you you i mean it's again it's a kind of a very unfortunate product of our electoral system i'm not saying it's good but actually if you are the premier of province you kind of have to do it and you can't keep everybody happy so you've got to decide who needs mm-hmm. to be happy um and you know it, yeah it, this is this is government that that by <sighs> It, it was with the brain not involved, you know, um, with, with no plan other than to be in power uh, and no real objectives other than to stay there. Well, that kind of brings us um, to our, la- our final story that we wanted to talk about, which was uh, the current provincial government is talking about reforming uh, the uh, electoral law in this province. Uh, <clears throat> they're proposing to, long story short, uh, Put greater oversight on in terms of third party uh, uh, entities in this province. So people like working class uh, uh, families and Ontario Proud would be under greater scrutiny. Uh, they would have a, a uh, 
their their funding would be limited to scrutiny for six months prior to the drop of the writ, as well as uh, greater. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, great, uh, I'm just reading the the notes here as I'm uh, as I'm reciting them. Great, uh, greater scrutiny in terms of uh, relationships between these groups and the political parties that they may or may not support. Uh, and I mean, all in all, I'm like that's 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 pretty good. I, I'm all I'm all for that. But then the other caveat is they're increasing the per person donation limit uh, up to $3,300 a year, which is almost double the current limit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, any extra regulation on third party donors, I think is a good thing. Um, certainly. Um, I mean, I'm somewhat surprised that the, that the government has gone this way and, and that Ontario proud was obviously a, a big help um, to the current government and was the biggest spender. Um, or among the biggest spenders, um, uh, other people who who you may be familiar from from the last election, Ontario Medical Association, and they obviously had a big uh, problem with the previous government over uh, Doctor Pay, uh, the Working Families Group, who are um, in essence uh, funded by uh, uh, unions, um, and the Ontario Real Estate Association. Um, those guys, <laughs> I'm not sure what third party advertising brings of any benefit um to us uh, because you know, was, so, you know the the OMA's advertising i thought was profoundly dishonest um for the last you know it's all this talk about you know the the government is ruining healthcare it's like no you're you're, you're having a salary dispute yeah. what you're having mm-hmm. that's nothing to do with uh, healthcare um uh the you know, and God bless the nurses. I'm not dissing on nurses at the moment, but I believe the nurses union was was uh, kind of the same stuff. I mean, I have a problem with the, with the advertising and with the political arguments making, not with the fact that they're defending well, their. That, I mean, the, pre- the the premise of yeah. it is you and if you and I have a beef with the government, if we're we're upset about an issue, um, you know, we if we find enough other people who are like minded, we can organize and put our money together, and we can start buying ads and, and run ads and and whatnot and in principle I mean that that sounds good that's that's political engagement that's grassroots engagement the the problem that you get into with these third party uh entities is that it it's, it's not grassroots it's not it's not the the you know the, the the voice of the people it's the voice of industry and of unions uh the work you know working families were you know they 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 were funded by unions. Ontario Proud was turns out was funded by the development industry here in the province during the last election, and that's you know that's I'll give this government credit. I'm I am okay with this. I'm okay with them clamping down on it and saying no greater scrutiny, greater tighter uh, uh, controls over that because yeah, I mean you're if you're a union or if you're a union you're going to go out and endorse candidates of your of your choice every union does in every election they come out and they say no we endorse usually it's going to be the liberal or the ndp candidate (laughs) very rarely have i seen them endorse a progressive conservative but hey that's their prerogative uh it's a free country but that's i mean that's where that's the you know that's that's how it's supposed to be a corporation could come out and do the same thing i could like loblaws could come out and say hey vote for the these candidates but they won't because they're more. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right. Re- yeah, they can't upset. Well, they can't the upset customers. the customers, and they're a little bit more. They, I mean, they they spend money on lobbying and 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 whatnot, and that's kind of their. That's how they they engage politically. Um, it uh, and I also think the the um, the advertising that these people do is among amongst the most. It's always negative. It's not. It's not vote right. for. It's right. vote against. Um, it's it's. I mean, Canada Proud obviously took the whole thing to an extreme um, and a very regrettable one, but they all do it. Uh, that goes for the unions and the OMA and the rest of them. It's it's like Party X is a disaster and a horror show. Mm-hmm. Don't vote for them. Uh, and the the lines that they use are generally, I believe, very unfair. Uh, and that may be... That, again, not a party political point. I, obviously, when <laughs> my past volunteering, I was on the receiving end of some of that criticism, I guess. It was my guys who were being criticized. So maybe I'm biased. But no, I actually think, I mean, having seen it um, kind of going both ways with you know people like the Working Families Group obviously attacking the PCs generally, 
Um, it's really the worst end of political advertising. And it's like, is this contributing to a debate or is this just well, my, my question? Is, uh, and the other thing I really want to mention is, is, is that the, the municipal elections, uh, it was the first election in 2018 ever where third party advertising had been allowed and its contribution was absolutely, uh, to create a more negative, more toxic, more unpleasant election well, than you, you, uh, had ever happened in uh, uh, what, what you had before. was uh, here in here, here in Burlington, a numbered company took out three separate ads against uh, one of the, one of the mayor. Yeah. We should be careful about what we're saying because there's a court right, case going on there at the moment. But the, I mean, it, that's, but what, what, that's what it came down to is, yeah. I mean, it comes down to a court case to settle this is it's not a political debate it's not a debate about the issues or or you want to say i disagree with this candidate's position on on x y and z um i you know it it turn it, it comes down to the old the, the oldest adage in politics is that money money speaks uh and it speaks loudly and it's in this day and age um you know it's very unfair to to look at the 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 landscape and say well who has the deepest pockets gets the loudest voice and the sad thing is, it's the same case with the upping the the donation limits, doubling the donation limits to thirty three hundred. That's huge. And I wonder, and I honestly wonder why, why, like, why, what point? I, that is one of the, again, it's one of these things that it puzzles me about this government. Is that I'm all for I'm all for clamping down on the third party advertisers. I support that. I would vote for that, and they have my my endorsement of that policy. What I don't get is the thirty three hundred dollar new campaign limit. Because that again, it just means that the people with deeper pockets, you go after them. Get write me a check for thirty three hundred. Okay, what does that get me? You know, it, it, it gets you a ritzier black tie dinner uh, at a at a convention center, and that's just the. I, I don't see the point of it. Like governments were campaigns. The parties were able to run campaigns in the past just fine on the sixteen hundred dollar campaign limit no nobody was sitting there going oh my gosh i can't i can't discuss my my point of view i can't make my i can't get my party's opinion on on the airwaves it's a during an election that's all that happens you have you have reporters asking each party leader what is your party going to do about this situation okay we have two or three debates about the issues don't tell me oh i can't get my message out i don't you know it just i i think my argument on the increase or my, my suspicion on the increase would be that um, you know, when, when corporate donations uh, were abolished, um, the ability to fundraise decreased dramatically for everybody, uh, PCs included, because uh, corporations could write um, – the only people who, who really write the maximum checks are corporations and unions. In the old days, you, know, you don't get uh, whatever the limit was, $1,100, say – Eleven hundred dollars doesn't come from an individual very often. If you if you're at a writing level, anyway, you, you'll get some, but very few. Um, what you will get is is corporations who are willing to write those maximum level donations to the central party, to a writing association, and however whatever the maximum number of donations they can make, because you can make you know uh, I think it was it used to be something like four or five ridings or something like that. When corporate donations and union donations were banned, those a lot of those donations still get made. They're now made out of personal accounts. How, um, what happens in, with that personal account? Um, you know, that, that, let's put it this way. Uh, um, if you go through the, the lists of donors to the parties, you will find uh Developers, business people are the ones who are making the, the the maximum donations out of their personal accounts. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong about that. I'm just suggesting that people who are used to pay out their corporate accounts will now pay out their personal ones. Draw what conclusion you want. Um, those people are as happy to write a check for three thousand as one thousand, and if, you, if they were able to write one for ten thousand, they would. Um, so yeah, so I mean, basically, why don't we ask for six uh, three thousand then? Um, the small stuff, you know, the it's almost impossible to get a rank and file member of the public to donate to a political party anymore because politics is so, um, uh, you know, <laughs> well, your political party is competing with with 
environmental groups and uh, all kinds of other organizations, uh, the United Way with charities, with the local hospital, you know, and in that competition, they're generally going to lose out. So they have to offer basically a, a three-quarter subsidy to get people to do it. Um, the parties are also subsidized, um, you know, and this is meant to be phased out, but they're subsidized to the tunes of millions a year as a per vote subsidy. Actually, I've got no problem with that. I just think you should just subsidize them probably 100% because basically <laughs> when it boils right down to it, nearly all the money that parties get are either from um, – Corporate donors, which is also um, refundable, but corporate done at a remove now, um, uh, or directly as, as uh, basically coming out of the public purse through tax credits. Um, so it's it's a messed up it's a messed up system, uh, and it you know I mean it compared with other places in the world, even three thousand dollars a year is a drop in the ocean. Um, you know, there's absolutely no limits whatsoever in, in the states. I think the third party advertising brings almost nothing to the table that that anybody would miss if it didn't exist. Um, maybe there's some kind of defense for it on the democratic front. So yeah, great. Uh, more, more regulation for sure. Um, and ask the question whether we actually need that kind of advertising. Um, you know, no one's stopping third party organizations from saying whatever the hell they want. That's freedom of speech. Um, and the unions and, uh, um, other organizations have been very good at that for decades. We're drawing to our limit here. Well, and truly, in fact, we're kind of over it, but you know, that that's a final thought, I guess I'd throw into the mix is that the ways the parties are funded, the way they are organized is the reverse of grassroots organizations it, it, parties. They don't openly think about this, but I think they think about it a lot is that basically the only time you need members is in an election year when you need people to actually go and knock on doors. The rest of the time donate or go away <laughs> because the, everything that matters is done centrally. Um, and I say that as you know, a 10 year volunteer who, loved every minute of what I did as a volunteer. So I'm not throwing anybody, un I'm really not throwing anybody under the bus. I'm just trying to recognize what, what is the truth and what those parties, if they're going to stop um, being perceived as basically not something you ever want to donate to, because I'll give my money to anybody else rather than those jerks, um, what they need to do to change to actually become genuine grassroots organizations that respect the members uh, and which are, um uh yeah but we're a thousand thousand miles away from that at the moment anyway uh i think that's probably everything we've got time for today and uh we we're going to be back on uh thursday with our 50th episode so uh get ready for the fireworks and the streamers and the uh, uh and all the <laughs> whatever else we can come up with um but uh in the meantime thanks everybody for listening and we'll speak to you again on thursday that's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns, or ideas for future episodes to our email, info at 905er.ca. We'd love to hear from you. You can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media, Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep 
and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.